um, because it, it really runs separate from your page, but okay. it has to be. Uh, so, and, so we, we, okay, we are now recording. Okay. Okay. Yes. Let, let let me set up a little bit of context, and then we'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Salat, and you sure. for you to start from the beginning. Um, uh, so, um, uh, in talking to Brave, um, uh, uh, in order to uh, about how SES can solve some of the problems that Brave is concerned with. Um, uh, we, uh, we examined the issue of, uh, the browser DOM API and the kind of hell that, uh, the Kaha project went through, uh, in constructing Damato. So the browser DOM API is a hellacious API to wrap and attenuate. Um, and, uh, uh, with a little bit of help from the browser, uh, we could do a lot better. Um, and the observation from Kevin Reed is that uh, if we could, um, for a given iframe, uh, intercept all of the network requests that were provoked from interacting with the DOM in that iframe, if we could do that, then that combined with the other uh, programming techniques that Kaha did as part of Domato that were not hellacious, uh, combined also with a trick from Jazzier, which I'll explain, uh, if we can intercept all of the network traffic, then the rest of it becomes a reasonable effort. Uh, the browser uh, specs have been refactored since then so that all of that network traffic goes through an internal fetch procedure. That internal fetch procedure was in turn um, uh, uh, used to uh, enable traffic to be intercepted by service workers, but service workers were not designed to be used as an enforcement mechanism. So, so, so a couple of questions based on that before Salah gets into his his, uh, his exposition. Um, one is the 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 DOM spec, the browser spec, uh, funnels everything through this fetch uh, operation. Do the actual browser implementations uh, comply with that? Yes. Yes. They, it, se it seems that the answer to that is yes, that the browsers themselves were actually refactored so that there actually is an internal fetch uh, choke point, bottleneck, whatever you want to call it, that all of that network traffic does indeed go through. And, okay. that, and, and that was kind of necessary in order to enable the service worker thing to work. Got it. Okay. And then the other is when you said the, the service worker thing wasn't designed as a, um, if you get exactly how you phrased it. As an, not, as an enforcement mechanism. As an enforcement mechanism. It was designed to be an unreliable caching mechanism. Right. So what, what when you say it's not designed to be an enforcement mechanism, how is it deficient from the perspective of, of using it as an enforcement mechanism? Okay. Uh, I can say what I understand there, but probably at this point, uh, uh, including for that question, it's better to turn it over to Sala, who who understands all of this much better than I did. Uh, yeah, so so it's really um, like um, um, I, I'm not sure about what the building blocks were to get to service workers, but definitely caching, an alternative to app app, app cache or application cache was was uh, being you know. Uh, viewed as a priority, and uh, so the idea for service workers was really to give you this thing that your web page will install, and basically it's, it, it creates um, a JavaScript um, um, thread that is separate from your page, um, you know, like really separate, like um, more removed than a normal worker, um, and it's kind of like a shared worker, um, the idea, though, was that when you visit a page, it calls um, certain APIs on that page to, on the first visit, install this uh, script as a service worker and then have it activated. Um, and once activated, it can claim whatever pages that install it. Um, only at that point do network requests um, that actually start with this copy URL 
uh, which can only be the, the, the parent folder, I believe, of the page or a subfolder uh, underneath that. Um, and it basically, at that point, any uh, requests will be routed through this JavaScript um, um, you know, instance that has like events to listen to fetch and um, other uh, related events. Um, and with the interception, it's able then to uh, remap a request to a different response, be it from caches or otherwise. Um, so, so obviously, the fact that it does not get engaged before your page can potentially run code um, means that um, some requests will escape the worker. Um, it's sometimes flimsy and it doesn't get really activated on certain pages even if you claim, not because of the specs, but rather because of implementation or uh, like browser implementation differences or uh, because of the fact that it's distributed over different threads and you know there, there could be bad um, you know, um, initialization sequences on, you know, in the scripts that end up losing certain traffic. Um, there is one approach that actually involves an iframe that I've been using to guard against all of that. Um, and the, it starts by actually caching uh, an iframe page. Um, in um, some browsers, you're able to immediately load that page inside the iframe. Um, and since it's loaded from the scoped URL, it is, in fact, the scoped URL. It installs the service worker, which is already there. Um, and then, um, you know, any, any requests to that scoped URL are, are actually captured. Um, you can use hacks like uh, creating a query for external URLs, so they actually go through the scope URL as a query on a request. Um, but, but these are all things that you're hoping that they actually work the same across all browsers. Um, at the end of the day, it is not really meant to intercept network traffic. Uh, an API like uh, Chrome's uh, requests uh, API, I think, is more um, intentional in that regard. Uh, but then again, it's not like a standard. It's really um, like an additional Chrome um, you know, that API. So, yeah, in a nutshell, service workers alone will probably not be enough um, or will be hacky. So they will be susceptible. So it sounds kind of like getting to install a little web server. Yeah. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. And in fact, there is, there is a demo where people did a mini express um, as a service worker. Uh, and it basically gets the payload, and then it does all the you know express-like API uh, to serve that content from a service worker. So, yeah, this, yeah. The the idea that the service worker is kind of a a little web server embedded in the browser, uh, uh, I think is 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 in fact the way this is stuff is thought of. Uh, I'll also mention a historic regret, um, uh, which is that uh, back in the HTML4 days, uh, there was this very clean conceptual separation between uh, the browser is for uh, ephemeral user interaction and the server is for uh, persistent semantic state. Um, and you know the browser page is something that the user can always just hit a reload on. It shouldn't damage the 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 persistent application semantic state. Uh, and but uh, of course having all the persistent state just be remote uh, uh, got painful and made disconnected operation impossible. Uh, so HTML5 ended up completely reinventing a new approach. Uh, new crappy approach to uh, local state. Um, and it was just a whole bunch of new mechanism that was in addition to all of the old mechanism. There was a proposal from Opera that I think was actually implemented in some version of Opera where you just include 
a logical web server in the browser. And now the web server in the browser can persist things in the way a web server does. Uh, uh, Bradley, uh, we are currently recording, so you'll know. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, so okay so so this thing from Opera, uh, you had a logical uh, web server inside the browser. I think they they short circuited the uh, XML HTTP request mechanism, so it didn't go through localhost. It just went directly from one thing to another in the browser, probably much like service workers are doing today. Uh, but in that proposal, uh, the HTML logical browser side of things remained completely ephemeral, and it was just this very nice separation of user interface versus state um, with a, um, uh, you know, keeping a, a arm's length separation between the two. Um, so it's, um, it's a shame that we lost that as, as HTML5 proceeded to introduce uh, local persistent state in, in completely other ways. That was just a uh, historical regret that I wanted to voice. Um, uh, Bradley, uh, what we're talking about is um, uh, introducing into the, well, the browser, um, all of the network traffic that you can provoke by interacting with the DOM goes through a browser spec mechanism called fetch. We believe that the browser implementations have also been refactored so that it actually goes through an internal fetch operation. And then um, service workers leverage that uh, to be able to have a service worker um, receive the network requests that were generated by uh, a fetch mechanism that was hooked by that service worker. Uh, the problem is, for our purposes, that the service worker mechanism was not built to be a reliable intercept that could be used as an enforcement mechanism. And that's, that, that was sort of the, where I was starting and, car, and is, is what I know. And then Sala knows a lot more about this. We were, we were, um, uh, he was proceeding to explain to us uh, a lot more about the server, service worker mechanism and how to use it. Okay, uh, Sala. Uh, yeah, so um, like I, I think I gave an overall um, summary of it, but um, maybe there are questions re regarding specific aspects of. Okay, so so let me tell you what I would have it. What I, the kind of mechanism that I would want in order to use it as an enforcement mechanism, um, and then we can compare that with what's actually possible as we go along. Uh, so, so first of all, uh, I would want the service worker uh, to be per frame, not per origin. So, um, uh, so when I so I would want to be able to and I would want to be able to create a service worker, then create a same origin iframe in which all of the traffic from that iframe went through that service worker. Um, and all the traffic, not just the traffic to a particular origin. Uh, so as I understand it, that differs from service workers in two regards. One is that the request from the for, to create the service worker comes from inside the iframe, not from outside the creator of the iframe. Uh, um, uh, actually, no, no. Like it, it, it comes from your initial page, like the page when it loads. It, it uh, basically uses a registration API to register a particular service worker script by uh, SRC, by URL. Uh, and that service worker script can be associated with the scope of the page, i.e. the path, um, the parent folder in which the page exists in, or any subfolder path, even if it doesn't exist. Uh, and that becomes something known as a scope. Now that that service worker is associated with the scope and it's registered, um, um, in most browsers, uh, next page load, even if it's inside an iframe on the on the initial page, 
um, that is actually referring to scoped URLs will actually receive, um, um, you know, be intercepted um, because they are URLs that are scoped and there's a service worker that is active that is listening okay. for requests from that scope. So that's, Any, that sounds good. That's, that sounds uh, uh, compatible with what we need. Yeah, but it's a bit fuzzy, though, because I know in Safari at some point I had to force reload the page after I installed the worker because the iframe uh, shared, I think, the same fetch um, uh, instance or the same fetch, you know, like um, occurrences of the main page. It didn't really create a new page load um, object to for which fetching is already um, bound to that service worker um, so so it could be tricky but but again you know if we can detect and force reload before loading inside the iframe that solves only one part of the equation which is any request for a, a path that is within the scope of the your of the service worker that we installed previously um, now, does the service worker intercept, okay, for, for requests coming from that page or those pages inside yeah. the scope, does the service worker intercept all network requests or does it intercept only network requests to that origin? So I did not look at the granularity when it comes to iframes, uh, but I know for a fact that if um, a service worker has to claim each client, and by that I, I believe it, it should qualify for, um, um, at the very least, for sandbox iframes. Um, so, um, so it basically has to claim each client. The, the, um, I'm not asking about the origin of the frame. I'm asking about the when the frame, let's say frame at origin foo does a cross origin request. To fetch content oh, from origin no, bar. No, no, it only it only intercepts requests from within the origin, within the scope uh, that it services, basically. I see. So yeah. That, so so that so that's probably the biggest thing that we'd need to change. Exactly. That's that's the you know the only the only approach I thought of was to use you know like back in the day when you had a PHP page with, and then you would just. Uh, put the URL that you want that is from outside your scope as a query, a search query. Um, so effectively, your service worker will be getting a query, a search query on a, a URL request that is really meant to load the page. But then if, if you're being hacked, then we're going to be polite, I think, and, and use that approach to make sure that your service worker can catch, right? So, um, I, I, so it's, yeah. It strikes me that the, the the thinking behind that limitation, the motivation for that, um, which is pretty conventional sort of web security hoo-ha, um, there, there is a legitimate concern behind it that I think if you propose adding a, a, a general network intercept uh, hook of the sort that Mark is proposing, that there needs to be a story, and, and you want to have this story up front, for how you, how you limit or, uh, or block that intercept thing from, from being used in particular places so as to have an answer to the, how do you prevent, you know, a, 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 a some code from just man in the middling all your network traffic from that page? Yeah, um, I, I actually have a question. Maybe Bradley knows. Um, do iframe load a, and you know network related events on the iframe instance uh, in the host page? Do those act as um, interceptable, um, like like background fetch capable hooks, or are they purely, um, you know, passive intended to be passive? Uh, you can't stop them if that's the question. So prevent default doesn't work. Stop pr propagation doesn't do probably what you want it to do. 
um, if that's what you mean by passive. Um, they, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so I believe that service workers and iframes at this point are missing the vital part um, of any URL other the, than the URLs you actually control. So, so right. I mean, the, the thing that, 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 that Mark is asking for, or proposing asking for, is a hook so that when we're running code inside a, inside a, a container, um, or inside a compartment, excuse me, I've been talking to the Kubernetes people all day, uh, running code inside a, a, a compartment, um, one of the things that you can do in setting that compartment up or a root realm, I, I'm not sure where it fits, a compartment. Uh, is, is, is to be able to virtualize the network um, so that you're in control of, of, of that, that compartment's um, network uh, activity. Um, and that same hook could, in principle, be used on a, uh, on a regular web page to enable an attacker to uh, virtualize all of that page's network activity to, you know, and, 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 and uh, uh, hijinks ensue. Yeah. So uh, the, the way the way to think about the 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 um, uh, the proper use of virtualization versus the improper use of it for man in the middle. Uh, let's start with an analogy, which is um, uh, the MMU uh, mapping virtual addresses to physical addresses is a man in the middle. Yes. Um, but of course, it's essential for security. We use it for virtualizing in order to achieve security. But if I could could uh, determine the mapping that you that the MMU is using for your memory accesses, uh, where I am not legitimately in control of you, uh, then it would um, be a genuine man in the middle attack right. rather well, than virtual MMU control is a system mode uh, a functionality as opposed to a user mode functionality. Well, oh. it's it's it's. Um, uh, so primitively, it's system mode versus user mode, uh, but the main thing is that it's layered. Is uh, um, if I create you, for example, maybe I'm 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 uh, creating a user level virtual machine. I load you into that. Uh, if I create you such that I could have run you under an interpreter or virtual machine that I had created, uh, then it is proper for me to be able to um, uh, to virtualize you now in the browser uh, the, the the notion uh, of create is a little bit tricky there because of cross origin um, uh, iframes uh, cross origin is not one of these creation scenarios um, uh, and the reason is that uh, if I create an iframe within myself, that loads content from another origin, uh, I do not have um, uh, the, the idea in the browser, the browser threat model is such that by having given that iframe to another origin, uh, it is not vulnerable to me in several ways. Uh, however, if it's the same origin iframe, uh, then there's no problem with saying that I can create a same origin iframe that I am in complete control over and able to virtualize because I could have just rewritten all the code before loading it into the frame. Or yeah. I could do a complete DOM intermediation as Kaha did. Yes, but, but from, from the perspective of me in user mode, if I create you and, and create you and give you a virtualized view of the world, from your perspective, I am operating in your system mode. That's right, that's right. But but the the, the um, yes uh, uh. could I um, could I um, just highlight um, 
There is a very, very similar concept that has been um, not standard, though, but it, it has been utilized uh, to create renderers uh, like like uh, Electron and all these other frameworks basically rely on it. And I believe that that, you know, comes initially, um, you know, um, baked inside most browsers like um, it's the web view. Um, and that's that's a, like a level beyond iframe. Like a web view is this um, abstraction of the browser uh, page view. Um, I'm, I'm completely unfamiliar with this. So pl pl please uh, start assuming zero knowledge on this. Okay, so so when we're when we're trying to create apps, desktop apps like Electron or other frameworks that allow you to do that, um, you basically. Um, find a lot of limitations in iframes. So they wanted something more, um, more um, interceptable, more customizable, and that's a web view. And in essence, a web view is when, when you, when you uh, embed a Safari view in your app that you're designing with Xcode or, you know, like, um, or if, um, if you have a Google app, um, I believe that your app runs inside a web view, which is a you know a step more um, uh, advanced than what an iframe is. So it's not a web compliant spec, but it is um, it is basically the abstraction of the browser view of a page with a lot more control on the on the uh, um, network hooks and other hooks. Um, and it's really meant. Uh, it doesn't actually, um, you know, belong within the page. It's it's an object that gets, you know, uh, rendered on top of your page uh, or through your page somehow. Um, and a web view has all these um, uh, requirements met because it's actually not designed to work on, with web pages. It's designed to work with uh, virtual web pages uh, and emulation of a web page. Uh, from raw HTML and scripts, and then hooks to um, you know uh, give the illusion of all the network um, um, behavior that you want. Um, I don't see this landing as a, as a web spec that anyone can use um, because the second half of service workers, where you can intercept other um, uh, requests beyond your origin. Uh, Salah, let me let me interrupt you. Uh, yeah. Michael, you just joined us. Be aware that we are recording right now. Okay, Sala, continue. Yes, okay, thanks. The, the second half was really um, a concern in terms of privacy because if, uh, if SES can hook uh, into all your um, pages requests back and forth, uh, then a hack can actually do the same. Um, I, if if there is a potential for introducing it, I believe that you know it will be a lot safer to say that it could be one other um, mode of sandboxing for iframes, where it will allow you to actually not be a passive uh, um, event listener to network traffic, but actually an active event listener, and it should uh, also come with the condition that it will really be sandboxed and, and isolated from the loading page. I, I believe you know these will potentially be the bare minimum um, security uh, um, you know requirements for something like that to materialize. But then again, you know, like I, I really don't know uh, how it would um, actually go through the standards process. But in, that's in my opinion, at least. What browsers support this? Um, WebView is in Chrome for sure because it's used by all the renderers. It's in Safari because I know that all all uh, iOS apps that have Safari embedded in them uses um, the you know the C the Objective C interface to their WebView. Um, so I, I like to think of it that those browsers create the WebView and then they create the browser to utilize the WebView API. To give you the experience of the browser. Okay. What about uh, Mozilla? Um, I am not aware of their internals. Okay. And yeah. is the nature of the API to the web view from Safari and uh, Chrome uh, uh, similar to each other? 
I don't really know much about the comparison. Okay. Um, they, they give you this, they, they solve the same problems, but um, whether they're one to one, I, I, do, I do not believe that Chrome's web view is an extension of um, uh, WebKit's web view by default. I think, you know, it's a, it's a re-engineered mm -hmm. um, interface, um, you know, to work better with Chrome's architecture. Okay. So, um, so another more privileged place to stand um, uh, is browser extensions. Can a browser extension reliably intercept all the network traffic? Uh, yes, we do that at GoDaddy for uh, some internal tooling okay. to see what's going on. Uh, Bradley, is, is that possible with Safari too, or is Safari a little more restricted there? Uh, we do not run a Safari extension anymore. Uh, the last time we wrote for that was three, four years ago, but it was possible at that time. What about Mozilla? It is possible. Okay. Uh, just to chime in about Safari, they've implemented their own Objective-C, well, basically binary extensions. They don't really use the JavaScript extension at all. Oh. Do you know if um, uh, the extension can reliably intercept all network traffic coming from a particular frame? That I'm not sure. Okay. Because uh, an extension, presumably an extension that um, uh, one could write a binary extension that gave code in one frame control over code in another frame. So the code in the controlling frame would basically be acting with the authority of the extension. Does that, does that seem possible? I don't know if Apple would ever approve that, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, at this point, I don't care about um, I don't care that much about approval. Um, uh, I, I, I'd be concerned that, the, that if I understand how browser extensions work, um, those are installed in the browser through a different pathway than uh, page loads. And so how you would, how would you would exploit those as a, as a mechanism for doing the things we want to do uh, seems problematic. So, I mean, the thing is, it, we need some kind of change to the browser in order to make the Domato problem uh, reasonable rather than extremely painful as it is now. Uh, and um, an extension is one way to explore uh, such a change to the browser without needing the browser maker to put the change in there. Uh, so you're, you're thinking, of, no, you're not thinking of the extension as the hook for intercepting uh, network traffic. You're thinking of it as the hook for being able to shim the browser uh, a change that we would like to advocate. Yes, yes, that's, that, yes, that's correct. Okay, very good. Yeah, okay, that makes a lot more sense to me. Okay, good. One point I'd like to raise, um, and I don't know if this is relevant or not. Um, I have seen announcements, uh, particularly on Slashdot, about Google changing their extension API in such a way that makes ad blocking harder. What I'm saying is you may want to keep an eye on whatever API changes they're talking about to see whether your capabilities that you're trying to implement are still possible. Okay. So that's, um, uh, I wonder, do you, do you have a sense if this is a targeted attack by Google on Brave? No clue. Okay. I, it's just a targeted attack. Well, it's not a targeted attack. It's an attempt to um, prevent ad blockers from existing except the ones that, um, um, that, that have a, a backdoor so that Google's ads don't get blocked. So there's also a little more to this. Um, there are some ad blockers out there on the Chrome extension store which do collect user metrics and that is part of the concern. 
That's true. That's true. Okay. Since Brave is making their browser, there's there's little Google could do to prevent Brave from doing the ad blocking that Brave wants to do. Uh, they're not sitting at, at, at they're not sitting in the place of being an extension maker. They're a browser maker. Right, they, they have the ability to sit on the network traffic outside of the browser engine that Chromium provides and therefore um, whatever Google does, they are still outside of that. What is the governance around the open source Chromium project? Uh, Chromium does have some uh, independent uh, efforts on it, but largely it is uh, upstreamed by Google whenever you merge stuff. So um, Blink in particular is the thing uh, people often don't associate with Google, but is largely controlled by Google within Chromium. Um, just like V8 is controlled by Google, uh, Chromium is a amalgamation of Google technologies with a open source uh glue, let's say. Okay. Okay. So there is one point to keep in mind that uh, a lot of the decisions uh, that um, Safari makes uh, is to avoid having to deal with uh, security issues. Like, they block certain things um, because potentially on paper they could look like security problems even if they aren't um their their model is not really blocking but it's more like they don't want to deal with um a problem with their security because the pr is is hard to deal with um so they just avert any kind of security problems that also makes them very receptive um, to things intended to actually give a better security model uh, for browser um, views because um, there are a lot of applications that use browser views that land in their app store. So, um, you know, there aren't good mechanisms um, to control the security of these kind of apps that are made with Electron and other apps, there is criteria, and if you meet it, uh, it's hard for them to actually um, enforce further security. So um, a standard way to enforce security on a web view, um, which would give hooks to particular origins um, from which SES can serve its, um, its APIs, um, can potentially be a viable um, you know, step forward, not not a, a request to offer hooks that people can misuse, but rather to offer a secure way to enforce, um, um, you know, um, man in the middle kind of approach um, from trusted locations, uh, trusted origins. So it's really worth exploring further, um, having a standard uh, in, in that regard. Okay. Um, good. Um, uh, it sounds like uh, this direction uh, is very much a productive direction to investigate, and that um, if we can come, come up with a specification for a good interception mechanism that's, compa that's uh, compatible with everyone's uh, security constraints and serves additionally uh, our security desires, um, uh, that uh, we might be on a path to seeing that happen. Mark, um, it, uh, going back to the very beginning of this conversation, probably well before you started recording, I had raised a couple of points in the messages side channel. Um, I'm wondering if you can take a quick look at those. Again, this is literally within the first five minutes of when okay. you were talking. Okay, I see them. Uh, the first one you said is, uh, man in the middle, question mark, are you monitoring after SSL decryption? Uh, could you right. expand on that? 
Uh, this is when you were talking about um, having some observation slash interception of the network traffic. Um, and I wanted to be I wanted to clarify what you were referring to at that point. Ah, so um, uh, what I have in mind is um, uh, before anything is uh, encrypted or after everything is decrypted. Uh, in other words, uh, you're sort of standing at the same place that you that you would st that we're standing when we replace the built-in XML HTTP request object with a attenuating shim over it. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that uh, Kaha did. So I'm really thinking in terms of the Kaha precedent. We had a URL rewriter, which is sort of an MMU for URLs, uh, where we could take any URL that the web page was trying to do um, IO to, and remap it uh, uh, in, through the controlling code. The code that set up the Kaha um, uh, compartment uh, could install arbitrary remapping code to map it to a different URL from which um, uh, the content would be fetched. Um, OK. Um, in that case, um, it does sound like a man in the middle, not necessarily an attack, but certainly a man in the middle in in the process. Well, it's so, so it's, once again, I want to make the MMU comparison. Uh, the key thing is that you had to be in an authorized creating relationship of the compartment in order to create the remapping that, the, that was constraining the, part, the compartment's ability to address the world outside of itself. Okay. Um... That's going to lend itself into the second question I raised, which is what prevents overly broad inspection slash involvement in this network API, in this uh, interception point? So exactly the same thing, which, by the way, brings up another issue with regard to the difference in interception that we need versus what solid described service workers do, which is um, it should be on a per frame basis, uh, not, and, um, uh, not a URL path basis. Yes. Uh, um, okay. okay. So one of the, one of the, the concerns that raises is based on where you need to stand to do this and where you legitimately could intervene or legitimately should be prevented from intervening. This sounds like a hook that needs to be installed as part of the compartment creation or compartment specification process. In other words, it needs to be part of the Realms API. No. 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 So where do you how do you the, the, how do you associate the the uh, I, I don't see how you get the I can control this thing I created, but I can't just arbitrarily reach in and dig with my environment. So, um, uh, your the the theme of what you're raising is right, but the, uh, the specifics are not. Uh, we're very we're being very careful that the Realm API is independent of host. Um, and it, um, so the Realm API doesn't know anything about uh, frames or DOMs or, or, or network traffic. It doesn't know that there is a network. Um, right. It's just dealing with the JavaScript language. Yes. Uh, and one way to think about its relationship to the host, my favorite way to think about its relationship to the host, to the, ho to the idea of a host, rather, Mm -hmm. is that the purpose, one of the main purposes of the Realm API um, that should very much shape the design of it is that uh, it should enable JavaScript code to act as host to other JavaScript code. Uh, and that also puts the control relationships, makes the control relationship very clear, which is um, uh, when I'm running in Realm Foo, 
and I use my realm constructor to say realm make root realm, and I make a new root realm bar, uh, I should be able to act as the host for bar, and uh, add, you know, and you know, I should be able to like I might be inside a node host, but I create realm bar such that it it thinks it's in a browser host or vice versa. Right. Um, so I should be able to em ideally emulate any host environment by writing JavaScript code. Yes. Um, so there's clearly a relationship here. Um, uh, the what I would uh, so going back again to the Kaha architecture, which I think is the right place to view it, which is in Kaha you make a let's call it a Kaha compartment by creating both a Domato instance and um, uh, for, for, for remapping and intercepting accesses to DOM nodes, uh, as well as also uh, re, um, uh, providing intercepted access to all the rest of the browser API. And then I also use the SES mechanisms to create a realm, and then I populate the the global of the compartment of the new realm with my emulated JavaScript objects, which are the virtualizations of the browser powers that I want code in the compartment to see. So the, the Kaha compartment creating mechanism uses the realm compartment creating mechanism. Right, that, that all makes sense. Uh both analytically and intuitively to me, but it feels like you've just reduced it to a previously unsolved problem in some sense. I think actually something you said in, the, in there was, was interesting, which is you have been talking in terms of, you know, what, could, what hook could we get browser implementers to install for us? But it suggests that whatever that is, that there should be a corresponding analog, say, in Node. Like, how would you want this to work in Node? Um, because you'd like it to work more or less the same. And it, it, it still, still raises the question of, where do you, where do you stand in order to uh, to acquire the authority with respect to the browser environment to make this intervention versus, um, and, and it has to do with the, this notion that I can make this intervention on a child thing that I create, but I should not be able to make this intervention on myself. Exactly. And, and, and so how can that be? I definitely buy the separation uh, the Realms API from any concept of I.O. I think that's completely, once you pointed that out, it was like, yeah, duh. But I still feel like we haven't answered the question of where would you stand to intervene? So, um, so first of all, let me just talk it through with Domato because I know that that answer is uh, both secure and coherent, um, uh, which is, uh, the code running directly on the page, um, on the real page with access to the real DOM, um, uh, uh, create, instantiates, you know, cr creates a DOM subtree, uh, uh, in, and I'll just be, be tremendously concrete, including for things that I want to be different in the new suggestion. Right. But in the Domato case, I cr uh, uh, I create a div to be the new the root of the subtree that I'm giving to the component. Um, uh, then I instantiate Domato, which is a library written in JavaScript. It's writ written in SES. Domato itself is written in SES. Um, but I give Domato access to the uh, the that div itself. So Domato is um, uh, is trusted 
in the sense that I gave it the real div and therefore it can do all the damage to me that you can do with the real div. Uh, Domato is the trusted code that I'm relying on to enforce my security policy. Um, and what it does is it creates a set of JavaScript objects that collectively act like a new iframe um, uh, so that the div that I gave it, it then presents to the code in the compartment as the document. Uh, basically, it creates, you know, it creates the whole document structure that you expect at the, at the um, top of the DOM tree, uh, mapping that top to that div. And then um, as uh, further uh, DOM nodes are created on either side of that boundary, it's a very membrane-like boundary. Uh, yes. it, actually, it actually predates membranes. It was all hand-coded. I, I see the where that's going, but yeah. let me, let me, let me, and, and, and if, if I'm off the track, then you can resume your narrative, but let me short circuit that a bit if I can, okay. which is, um, the, in Domato, if you want to intermediate all of the accesses to the network, what you have to do is all of the DOM API points at which you could have network access, you have a Domato implementation of those which intermediates the network access. Exactly. And, and in the case of what you were talking about, though, was the, the low-level fundamental network access uh, uh, operation that the browser implements, and that is is not a reified thing in, in, in at the at the at the DOM API level and therefore where would you where would you stand in order to exercise such a hook if it existed I mean, would it what how would it be reified uh, such that the browser had a notion of of I'm creating a, 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 a compartment in which I have intermediated the network access. What does that even mean from the browser's point of view? Okay. Um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, let's see. I, I see uh, several more um, comments in chat. Uh, should any of those go first, or should I proceed to answer uh, Chip's question? Um, I think the point I made was related, but I can go afterwards. Okay. Um, so the kind of thing I have in mind is, uh, I'll just go ahead and put a, a straw, a concrete straw API out there so that we, so that we have a concrete okay. example to, to examine, uh, which is there is an API call for creating an iframe. Um, uh, you know, you can also create an iframe, of course, uh, with HTML. Um, uh, but let's just take the explicit API for creating an iframe. Um, and let's say that uh, we enabled an additional options parameter of so somehow. Uh, I won't try to design what the mechanism is for, you know, what the, the concrete parameter syntaxes for this new option, but somehow we provide a new option where uh, we uh, parameterize the creation of the iframe with a function. This is not, th this is once again, just for concreteness, uh, it's this, this way of doing it does not look like a service worker, but it's the simplest concrete interception. Um, and now what happens is this function is the network handler for the created iframe. I can only do this for when I'm creating a same origin iframe for the for reasons of the um, uh, security, um, uh, the security assumptions, again, that the browser is making, the security model that the browser is trying to enforce. I can only do this for a same origin iframe. But for the same origin iframe, when I do this, then what happens is uh, uh, anything that happens in the iframe that would cause um, a fetch uh, by 
that iframe or cause any network traffic by the iframe. Uh, so let me just, I, since I'm, uh, since I don't, let, let's, let's just make a blank statement. So, so it's robust if I'm wrong about uh, the scope of fetch. Any network traffic that comes from that iframe, uh, rather than going to the network, uh, would call this function uh, with a description of the network request that it's trying to make. And then the response to the function would be a description of, of the virtual response that um, uh, you got back from the network. Uh, and, if, and because the network is asynchronous, it could be, let's say, uh, the function returns a promise whose uh, fulfillment is eventually the description of the result of the network request. And there's, you know, way, different ways to do that, uh, but let's just do it with a promise. Yeah. So, so, so the, once again, to short circuit things a bit, the answer to my question is the hook is on the iframe creation call. Yes. And, and everything else is details beyond that. That's right. Okay. So, okay. So that actually answers my question to my satisfaction. Just, just that. Okay. I have a second question, which is completely unrelated, which is having identified network traffic as a particularly sensitive thing that you want to virtualize or intercept or however you want to frame it, um, it causes me to raise the question of, okay, network traffic, what else? Are there other okay. things that so are in that category? In other words, is Network traffic sui generis, or is is there uh, uh, are there other bits okay. of browser functionality or yeah. underlying the, host functionality that warrant the same kind of treatment? The answer is yes. Uh, the reason why I'm focused on network traffic is that the experience of Kaha says that if we can get the browser to solve that problem for us, we have adequate solutions for everything else in user code, but they're still painful. Uh, if we can get more from the browser that is along the same lines, which, which might be possible because we already have one ask for one ra that's justified by one rationale, everything that's justified by that rationale, if it's not su substantially more mechanism, maybe we can get. So I'll, I'll enumerate what's on the top of my head. Um, uh, there is evaluation. Um, uh, which is the thing that I was going to turn to uh, Jasner's trick for, but even with Jasner's trick, it's still messy. Uh, if I could directly hook all the ways to provoke the DOM to evaluate JavaScript code by having the JavaScript code handed to an evaluator that was provided on iframe creation, then of course I can take that string to be evaluated and do all of my nice SES things. So I treat all of that code as SES without having to do any tricky thing with the DOM. Um, uh, so, that's, so that's number two. Um, another one is local storage. Uh, the, um, uh, I certainly need to intercept that. I can intercept it with a proxy, but if I could just intercept it, that would be better. Um, uh, uh, network traffic has to include all the network traffic, including web sockets and uh, server side events. I, I don't know if that goes through push or service workers. Uh, Salah, do you know? Uh, no, like I don't know beyond um, resource requests. Okay, right. So, so, so I can answer that. <clears throat> Everything is being pipelined through fetch. Uh, all new things are, even retroactively, some old things were moved to the fetch pipeline. Okay. Service and events do go through it. Web sockets do go through it. But like Sala said earlier, there are limitations about what you can intercept with a service worker. Okay. Um, yeah. So 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 uh, just from a from a sort of rhetorical angle, maybe rhetorical is the wrong word. Uh, in terms of in terms of the the thing that 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 might be easiest to sell 
to browser implementers, um, one approach is to say, well, what's the minimal thing, which is what the, the I think when you, when you raise network traffic, that was, I think, your, your take. Um, um, having a list of several different things with possibly more things um, is more stuff, but it also hints at, oh, here's a general purpose mechanism. Here's a general thing as opposed to something specialized. And it's sometimes easier to get people to buy into a, a, a generalized uh, thing than it is to get them to buy into a specialized thing because it feels like the, the scope of applicability and usefulness is broader. Uh, that, that all makes sense to me. And which, 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 which would be more uh, uh, saleable in some sense is, a, is an open empirical question, but I'm just saying don't assume it's one way or the other. Okay. Um, so uh, then, of course, through the DOM itself, the code inside the frame interacts with the user. Uh, and um, uh, the reason why um, uh, we're, we're, we're seeking a mechanism where we can just directly provide access to the DOM nodes, if we can intercept interaction with everything other than the user, is because uh, the iframe mechanism is already pretty good at uh, attenuating the interaction to the user by limiting it to a rectangle on the screen and doing that bidirectionally, both with regard to rendering to the user as well as receiving events from the user. Uh, however, it's a inflexible box. Um, so, uh, you know, if I can just, you know, wave a magic, you know, in, in terms of everything that I might think to ask for, there was a proposal at one point for creating an iframe that's rendered into the flow of the containing page. Um, uh, so that you could, um, so it's, you know, it's, it's acting more like a span or a div or something. Um, uh, that's, I think that one's unlikely. Um, uh, the, uh, okay, I, I see there's a, um, Sala, I, I, I am, I have, I have successfully remained almost completely ignorant of CSS, so, um. Oh, oh that, that was a punch, you know, like, uh, punchline after, uh, Alex's remark, that's all. But, uh, is CSP is what I wanted to actually bring to the table and HTML uh, 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 element. Uh, 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 right. So yes, yeah, CSP, uh, I don't know how to think about that and how it relates to any of this, but obviously it's relevant. Uh, and what's, yeah. the, what's the issue with HTML element? Uh, HTML template element, uh, that's secondary, but uh, I, I wanna share my screen to show you what I just found about the iframe getting CSP. Okay. So uh, let me see if that still works like it should. Um, we can share that particular window. So um, I, I, I usually like to uh, see what's new, right? So I found that there's this experimental CSP. Um, so far, it was only possible to define CSP through two mechanisms. Uh, I believe there's headers that you could send from the server that provide uh, policy for what kind of uh, resources for the various destination types of resources um, can a resource come from um, and even put some restrictions as, as in, you know, uh, a hash uh, that you check the resource against. Um, um, so, so CSP doesn't have much discussion here, like on MDN. Um, but what's important to note is that um, Chromium does uh, support it and MDN has the document. Uh, so by extension, Firefox is potentially um, uh, considering it. Um, I know that CSP has been very favorable for Safari on, on you know, other fronts. Um, and uh, Internet Explorer, I don't think we can support. Edge is becoming Chromium. So, so, um, so at the end of the day, I believe CSP on iframe uh, will look something like, uh, yeah, sorry. Down. 
sorry about that. It's all right. So CSP basically will allow you to, uh, I'm trying to find the, yeah, it will allow you to, instead of defining the policies in your own page or defining the policies by the server headers, um, you could actually inline those policies as attributes for the iframe, hence uh, restricting any access to resources that do not get forced through the service worker. That's one piece of the mix. Um, the second piece is, is HTML template elements, where basically what you would be doing is any content being put inside the DOM of the iframe, you put it inside a template element, which makes it inert in any regard. Oh. And you listen to mutations on that template element. Um, and then you use, you maybe actually attach a shadow DOM to your uh, iframe's body. And, and you basically slot elements that have been cleansed i.e. Uh, SRC attributes and uh, script tag uh, body um, can, can basically be um, um, scrubbed um, where you rewrite all URLs to force them to go through the service worker. So even if anything escapes that, oh. uh, the iframe will basically refuse um, um, the uh, security violation of loading something that is not doing that. So this would be this would intercept all network traffic. Uh, network traffic that that we can intercept in a declarative form will be rerouted as a search param if it's cross origin on the service worker, uh, um, you know, fetch hook, and and the service worker will effectively take that search parameter and do the request on behalf of the. Uh, iframe, uh, scrub the contents and give it to the iframe. Um, and if a network request does not make it through the scrubbing process, which I mean, it's it's unreasonable to think that you cannot scrub things you're putting inside a sandbox iframe, uh, if you can control everything going into it. Um, so at that point, um, um, the request comes, you scrub it, you put it back in the iframe. For some reason, if someone you know, with the inspector um, actually fetches something that is not um, um, going through the right channel, it's going to violate the CSP of the iframe, and the browser will reject that request without it hitting the service worker, uh, but it will be interceptable as an event, if I'm not mistaken. Well, this all sounds wonderful. Uh, it sounds like for browsers that have this feature, um, am, am I understanding correctly that for browsers that are supporting this, we might already have all the mechanism we need to do everything else that we're talking about at user level? I believe so. And if they didn't, what you would do is you would have an iframe um, where you have the CSP in the header that creates inside it an iframe uh, with same origin that will basically effectively be um, uh, forced to conform to the same CSP. So I think the CSP property just is a sugaring to avoid writing all this boilerplate. Uh, again, theoretically. <laughs> so so, um, so, uh, so are you, were you already planning to you know, do some experiments along these lines? Um, all I do is experiments, so this is the kind of experiment that I would definitely love to do. Um, I, I'll have to uh, start on that, though, uh, not next week, but maybe end of next week. That would be awesome. That would really be extraordinarily useful. All right, but, but again, um, my experience so far with, uh, with this kind of, um, you know, um, spec-based um, catch-all across all browsers is you will get uh, things that you, you can't really do anything about. And sometimes they will change a spec after you've relied, after you came up with the design um, that will basically render the work uh, useless.
So, so these are all things that trade offs, right? So it's going to be experimental, okay. um, and um, I, I accept those, um, you know, risks. Okay, uh, it sounds like, uh, in terms of being able to ask the browser implementers. Uh, to fashion the minimal differential request, the closer that we can come to our goals using mechanisms that are already there, plausibly the smaller and less weird sounding the differential request would be to close the gap. Yeah, I agree, definitely. Great. Okay, um, we have about 30 minutes left in this session. Mm -hmm. Well, be before we leave uh, this topic, um, uh, there was one outstanding question that I'm wondering if anybody else has an answer to, which is, is there any other way that code inside a frame inter is enabled by the browser to interact with the world outside the frame uh, that we have not yet already examined? Uh, possibly message events. Oh, like post message. Exactly, yes. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, now that one, uh, they all go through a narrow API that can be virtualized, right? I don't see why not. Um, okay, so but but uh, I've I haven't used message events enough to say that for sure. Okay, but it's so so it's in the same category as the other ones that are easy to virtualize. But if we're asking the browsers for a complete solution, those would be part of the complete solution. I think there are um, same origin restrictions on messaging uh, between frames, and I'm almost certain that Safari does not allow frames to message one another, uh, or did not at least. Um, but it does allow um, a client and a service worker to um, message one another, um, and a worker and its parent to message one another. OK. Anything else? Any other interactions with the outside world? Well, excellent. Um, uh, uh, any remaining ones are at least obscure enough that it didn't come to um, the top of any of our heads. Um, We have a long list of comments uh, in the sidebar, Mark. Oh, okay. So yeah, let's let's go through them. Um, so just got, uh, starting from the top, we took took care of Alex's first comment. Alex's next comment was, uh, "What prevents overly okay? That's the the overly broad inspection involvement. Is that also so, sort of the 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 same question that was already answered? Definitely related. I believe it was what you were asking earlier. Okay. You raised earlier. We, we definitely covered both of those first two points. Okay. Uh, Bradley, only the origin for which, uh, for which registered it, which I think was a clarification rather than a question. Um, Alex, uh, one more point to raise. Uh, can there be a guarantee slash spec rule that specifically states this network interception layer is inaccessible to web pages and web extensions? Okay, I don't understand the question. Basically, I was coming at it from the standpoint of, wow, you're having an, a uh, man in the middle in, uh, manipulating network traffic. Um, you definitely don't want to have that in any way accessible to web pages or web extensions. So, does, so is that also covered by the answer that only the creator can control the created? I would think so, um, probably. I'm not 100% certain. I'm just 
thinking in terms of okay, what happens if uh, if somehow there's a security hole that we missed? Okay. Uh, uh, but then that's an area I really don't understand how to answer anyway. So. Okay. And then uh, Sala, I have one update on iFrame plus Service Worker. I assume that's an update we've already gone through. Uh, yeah, we did. Yeah, okay. it was CSP. Um, I was just reaching that conclusion as I posted that. Okay, Michael, you have a question about Domato? Uh, no, it was covered in, in depth. I'm fine. Okay. Uh, uh, Alex uh, notes standards standardized promise API does return a promise. I mean, standardized fetch API does return a promise. Very good. Uh, so that fits very well with the kind of virtualization hook we would want to be able to provide. Um, yeah, it's definitely an evolution from where XML HTTP requests started. Okay. Uh, Sala, important detail in the mix we have not discussed at all, CSP. So that's is that the CSP discussion we just had? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Alex, I see a need for a filter. It's unlikely you're going to care much about PNG images versus scripts. Um, so it depends on the purpose. Um, uh, the, what we did in Kaha was we intercepted anything, but you know, the, the thing that was getting the interception uh, could decide you know, what to do, um, uh, uh, you know, could decide to, to care more about the scripts rather than the PNG images but we still gave them all to the interceptor. So um, there's a caveat here that might not be known to everybody. Uh, JavaScript in the script golem browsers is not checked for content type ever. Yep. So uh, even, it would be very hard for us to determine if something is actually going to be used as a PNG image. Okay. They can even go and download it and then take the image data and then convert it to a script and run it. Okay, uh, that, that's, that's all true. Uh, suggestions? I'd I just intercept everything for now. Okay. My only, my only su suggestion there when I said filter was you may want to build a filtering mechanism into the API in some way. I'm not saying you should. I'm saying you might, you want to consider it. Okay. So here's something we probably want to uh, add to the to the hook that I would guess is not part of what the service worker gets, which is some indication about the reason why it's being fetched, or, or put another way, uh, what. Um, is it being fetched as an image or is it being fetched as a script, uh, um, which is... Uh, it is in fetch events under dot purpose. Oh, it is, okay. It's being removed though. Ah, I don't ah, remember ah. why. I, I think destination is also a part of request. Uh, a request has a destination that uh, is one of the various uh, media uh, um, um, you know, um, output, uh, yeah, output um, uh, purposes of, of the particular resource being um, mm. fetch, being requested. So it kind of, um, I think it, it uh, influences the kind of headers that get sent to servers okay. uh, to return a content type for a particular destination um you know, of, of that particular response that the page will receive. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I think, I think we should um, ask for the purpose or destination mime type or something uh, to be part of uh, the hook that we're getting, uh, whether or not it remains available to service workers and whether or not our hook resembles interposing a service worker. Okay. Um, uh, HTML template element. That was uh, Sala. What you covered that uh, these things are there. The I/O from them is already naturally suppressed, if I understood correctly. Yeah, they're inert. They belong to a, a non-rendered document instance, which does not have any um, 
active um, content. It, it just has DOM nodes that are basically um, inactive on all, um, you know, um, network and, and rendering and other, other overhead. It's kind of like a document fragment, um, but it's a wrapper for a document fragment. So let me, let me just be, uh, um, uh, so to ask concrete questions here, if sure. inside an HTML template element, I create a, a script node, a source equals some specific URL, it just sits there inert as I constructed it. It does not fetch anything from that URL. Um, I, yeah, that, that's absolutely like, like the model I'm thinking in my mind is that we would, uh, instead of uh, providing um, um, the DOM of the um, iframe that we're uh, compartmentalizing, we're going to provide an element, a root element inside the content, the document fragment of an HTML template element. Um, I have to look into mutation related, um, um, you know, um, uh, costs, but there are mutation observation methods um, which which are very functional on non-inert content. So the trade of it being inert might actually make it a little bit more difficult um, to use uh, mutation uh, events. But I'm pretty sure you know uh, there will be ways to 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 get there. Anything that you add to that child uh, root element of the content of the HTML element will basically look like it's in the DOM. Uh, it will be um, in this proxy DOM that has no um, active role. Um, and once we scrub mutations to that um, um, you know, um, node, we can mirror them onto the document um, the, the actual ah, document. Ah, ah, I see, I see. Yeah, so, so it will take a lot of work to come up with a model that doesn't, um, you know, uh, feel uh, awkward, uh, but I'm pretty sure there will be, um, you know, ways to do this that are favorable to what we want and ways to do this that will not be favorable. So it's going to be, you know, um, some creative problem solving. Okay, so let me go over what I think I just understood from that you would still have two layers uh, in the same sense that Domato has two layers. You're not giving the untrusted code the DOM nodes by which the rendering happens to the user or by which user interface events are received from the user. Rather, you're giving them a parallel but inert tree uh, and the advantage of it over Domato is the nodes already have, even in their inert behavior, much of the DOM semantics, so you don't have to write new code to emulate it, but you still have to write new code to uh, reconcile state between the two DOM trees. Um, I, I want to raise one other point, if I may, that I just thought about. Uh, Sal, I mentioned mutation events. I sincerely hope he doesn't mean the deprecated DOM mutation events model. Um, mutation observers have been around for a few years now, and they're much superior to the old DOM mutation events. So with regard to the, to the goals here, uh, I certainly want to be able to emulate all of the old browser crap that tremendous numbers of web pages use um, uh, because if I was only concerned with new code, I wouldn't be giving it a DOM interface in the first place. Okay, I'll admit that made me laugh for a moment. Okay. Um, uh, so Sala, did, did my summary of the two layers um, uh, fit with what you were explaining? Yeah, I think uh, I'm, I'm talking very abstract about mutation at this point, uh, but it will be that any mutation that will be uh, listened for or observed will also only ever occur in the inert document fragment. Um, 
we have to actually uh, synthesize how it reflects on the uh, non-inert uh, fragment. Um, it sounds um, like I really have to explore this a little bit further to see whether or not it will be like crazy overhead to do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, the best mechanism for mutations that, that like mutation observer uh, is definitely the way to, to go. Um, but I don't know how it functions inside the uh, template element. Um, so, so it, it requires a little bit more um, exploring and experimentation. Okay. Um, I see uh, Bradley, I'm skipping, skipping ahead in the chat. I see Bradley said that it's the old mutation events are about 1% of page loads uh, for the purposes that Kaha was used for and anything that I'm planning to do. Uh, that would say um, uh, we can just not worry about old mutation events. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to lose 1%. Uh, Brave is, um, I, I would be pretty sure, a different story, that 1%, um, uh, it would, um, uh, they would consider to be high enough to be painful. Um, but, you know, Brave's not here to speak for themselves. Um, um, Okay, going back to the chat order. Um, uh, Alex, tell me about uh, CSS making iframes flexible in layout. Uh, that was just me being uh, making a joke, that's all. Oh, okay, okay. Um, uh, let's see, then Alex, uh, uh, platform status shows of Mozilla, shows list of features under development by various browsers. Uh, was there uh, anything that um, uh, was relevant and not and that we didn't cover uh, about uh, the Mozilla features? Um, not that I'm aware of, um, but keep in mind I'm I'm very much on the fringes of Mozilla these days. Um, the main reason I, I posted that link was the mention about iframe element .csp, which I frankly hadn't known about. Okay, um, and I had hoped, unfortunately, in, without. I had hoped that it would show up in that list of uh, features, and I'm not. I didn't see it there. Okay. Um, uh, so you have a question about caching? Yes, um, and this is related to the next point I raised about generated blob objects, uh, data URLs, and other re local resources. Um, I raised the point earlier about what happens if somebody brings in a PNG image versus a script, and how you might want to filter. And it occurred to me, well, what happens if some nefarious actor decides, well, if we bring in this this uh, script first as a PNG image and then convert it to a script, is it going to go through this network layer? I'm sorry, this network interceptor. Forgive me. I don't know what to call it. <laughs> um, so if it goes through there the twice. Pipeline. I'm sorry, say again? Um, it? It's usually called the fetch pipeline. Fetch pipeline. Okay. I should have written that down a long time ago. Um, but the point I was getting at was, with regards to caching, suppose that this um, script that you're trying to intercept is first fetched as a PNG image, say. And then your filter says, oh, we don't really care about it. Then it's in the cache. And then it doesn't get caught because it was cached when it comes in again as a script. I'm just raising it as a point to look into. Okay. Um, um, ditto with uh, generated blob objects, data URLs, local resources of that type. Um, would those go through your fetch pipeline interception as well? That's so, what I'm asking about there. So I'm going to uh, propose the, or take the stance that um, uh, data URLs uniquely should not go through this intercept. Data URLs really are just internal data and are not in any sense interaction with the outside world. I would amend that to include blob URLs as well. Um, tell me about blobs. I don't know about blobs. Okay. Think of a, a data URL is basically a way of storing a string of source code in a URL. It's an encoding mechanism. Mm -hmm. Blob is the next generation where instead of having the source in 
the uh, URL itself. It's stored in memory in the browser somewhere. It doesn't really matter. And then you can convert that to a URL, which starts B-L-O-B colon. And then you have a unique identifier at the end of it. And it's a similar way of, of storing something in memory and then being able to load it like you would an iframe or a script or something else. I, I, I think I'm not understanding yet. Is there, uh, is there a piece of text that begins B-L-O-B? The URL. The URL of what you're trying to refer to. So the, uh, the, you and I can take that offline. I don't okay. want to hold up the rest of the meeting for that. Okay. I, I can show you examples of that I've actually used in my own uh, membrane uh, GUI. Okay. Um, okay, so we covered the um, old mutation events. Uh, and, oh, and they're trending up, uh, which, yeah, that's odd. Um, uh Oh, and Sala says that the old mutation, you're referring to the old mutation events? That they have been broken lately? Uh, no, no, I was actually talking about uh, platform statuses. Um, as uh, There have been a move to change the mechanisms by which the data was populated. Um, so you're likely going to find more up-to-date information about the status of features for browsers by going and looking at developer um, discussions and, and bug reports and so on in their own um, repositories. So they're not up to date. You don't get um, a, a, an accurate picture of what's out there uh, from all these status uh, sites. Okay. Oh, um, does... So um, browsers now implement the new module system, the ECMAScript module system, uh, and they do it with primitive loader behavior that's not reified and is just implemented directly by the browser. But do the network requests provoked by that loader go through fetch? Yes, and we have working examples by Sala and me of intercepting them. Okay, great. And are they, uh, is their purpose marked, made clear? Not exactly. Okay. They, they have, uh, they do say they're coming from a script, uh, but you don't know uh, which kind of script they're coming from, which can be a little confusing. Okay. So, um, so we've also talked about hooking loaders um, uh, that could also make sense to do at this level. Um, you know, the page itself has a loading behavior. Uh, if you're creating the page, uh, it rather than just hooking the fetch part of the loading behavior, uh, we could do more the more invasive kind of hooking the loading behavior uh, that you know that, that we've been talking about in general at the JavaScript level. Uh, but do it for the page's outer loader if you're creating the page. Yes, we were testing compatibility of nodes loaders with that oh. sort of example. Cool. Um, we have a slightly out of date, slightly broken now thing, but it could be updated. I put the link in the chat. Okay, great. It is very slow. Um, if you click on how it rewrites test.js, you will start to see it is rewriting your imports in a very ugly way. But it, it's doable is the point. So we don't need to go into details. Okay. So we have 10 minutes, and I do want to talk about decorators before next week's okay. meeting. We okay, okay. Um, so let's let's switch topics. Uh, let me ask, before we switch topics, let me ask a uh, meta point. Uh, so we're starting to develop a more of a habit of occasionally recording, and we have the YouTube channel for posting publicly. Uh, should I, do, when I am recording, should I do it per session or per topic? I think per topic. Okay, so let me stop this recording, and to avoid the problem 
uh, that we had last time, um, uh, wait for me to confirm that I've started a new recording before talking, or before, before you know, you can talk, but before starting on, in on the new topic. Sure. I did send 